Hi everyone, welcome to this memory map on work, energy and power. As always, the goal of the memory map is to revise your fundamental concepts as quickly as possible. Now in this memory map, we have tried to do something a little different. We have tried to revise the concepts of work, energy and power by taking a literal walk in the park. So come with me as I walk through this wonderful garden and try to see if I can relate the concepts of work, energy and power in things that we see in our everyday life. The first concept that we'll talk about is the concept of work. Now by definition work is the product of force and displacement. But it is important to remember that work is not just the product of force and displacement but the product of force and the displacement which takes place in the direction of force. Mathematically, this means that work is a dot product of force and displacement written as F dot S. Now, F dot S we know is nothing but F S cos theta. And from this, it's very obvious that for different values of theta, there will be different values of work. For example, if theta has a value of 90 degrees, then work will come out to be zero because cos 90 is zero. But on the other hand, if theta is 0, then work comes out to its maximum value and this is because cos 0 is 1, which is the maximum value of the cos function. So this tells us that for different values of the angle theta, which is nothing but the angle between force and displacement, we have different values of work. And from this formula itself, we have three different types of work. The first one being positive work. Now, by definition, positive work means when force has a component in the direction of displacement. Let's take a look at what this means. Now, if you take a look at this coconut tree, we can see that this coconut is falling in the downward direction. And therefore, I say that the displacement of this coconut is in the downward direction. But the gravitational force acting on this coconut is also acting in the downward direction. And therefore, I say that not only is the force downwards, but also as I said earlier, the displacement is also downwards, which means the angle between the force and the displacement in this case is zero. And if the angle between force and displacement is zero, it means force is in the direction of displacement. And this is an example of positive work. Similarly, we have the concept of negative work. Now, negative work by definition would be when force and displacement are in opposite direction. So, if I take a look at an example of this in the park, I can see that two children are on a seesaw. And you know that the seesaw moves because of the weight of these children. The weight of one child acts in the downward direction and due to this weight acting in the downward direction, the other child experiences a displacement in the upward direction. So, I say that the gravitational force, which is nothing but the weight, acting on this child here is in the downward direction. So, I say F is downwards. But because of the weight of this one child, there is a displacement in the other child, which is in the upward direction. So, the force of gravitation of the first boy causes a displacement in the second boy, which are in opposite directions. So, as you can see in this case, the force and the displacement it causes are in opposite directions, which means that they have an angle of 180 between them. And this is an example of negative work. The third and final type of work is zero work. Now, by definition, zero work means that force and displacement are at 90 degrees to each other, which means force and displacement are perpendicular to each other. An example of this would be, look at this man carrying this really heavy load. Now the gravitational force acting on this load is nothing but the weight of the load which will be acting in the downward direction. But at the same time, the displacement of the object is to the right. So the object has gravitational force acting on it in the downward direction. But even though gravitational force is pulling the object downwards, the object is being displaced to the right. And therefore, in this case, I say that the angle between the gravitational force and the actual displacement of the object is 90 degrees. And in this case, we have again zero work. And so I say that gravitational force is doing zero work on this object. 
Now we have spoken about how to calculate work in different cases. But every time I was taking the force and multiplying that by a displacement and then by the cos of the angle, that's Fs cos theta. But what happens if my force changes at every single position? So I'm asking the question that what is the work done when the force is variable? So, for example, if I go from one point to another and at every point the force changes, where will I apply Fs cos theta and which F will I take? And therefore, we have a different subsection that is what is the work done by a variable force? And the answer to that is that mathematically, when the magnitude and direction of the force changes with position, the work done by such a variable force is found for an infinitesimal displacement. Simply speaking, now you will start finding out the work done for small pieces of displacement. And because you're finding it for a small displacement, it's a small work that is dw and this is found by taking the force in that small displacement and dotting it with that small element of displacement which simply speaking is f dot ds. You can also find the work done between two points graphically. Graphically, we say that the work done between any two points, say in going from A to B, is nothing but the area of the force displacement curve with proper sign. So to elaborate on the mathematical treatment, let's take a look at what I mean. Now, as I said before, if you want to find the work done by a variable force, you have to consider the fact that when the magnitude and direction of a force varies with position, the work done by such a force is found for an infinitesimal displacement which we call ds. And then the formula that is f dot s becomes f dot ds because now you are not finding the work for the entire motion but you are finding the work for an infinitesimal displacement. So you are finding a small work for a small displacement. So you have dw that is small work for f dot ds where ds is small displacement displacement. Now the meaning of this is for example if you have a path in which you go from point A to point B you will see that at this path you have a displacement which is in different directions at every point. Now also I say that at every point the force is changing that is force is dependent on the position. So for example if I ask you how to find the work done at a particular point in this path then what I have to do is look at that particular point, take a small displacement at that point, find out what is the force acting on the object at that point and then do a dot product of this f with this ds which is simply f dot ds or f ds cos theta where theta is the angle between this force and the displacement. So to recap, when you have a force which is variable, that is if the force is changing with position, you start finding the work done for a small displacement or a small part of the motion. And then you ask the question, in this small part, what is the force? How much is this small part? And then you dot the force with the displacement to get the small work done in this infinitesimal displacement. Similarly now I can also explain the graphical treatment which I have already spoken of. Now graphical treatment says that the total work done in going from some point A to a point B is given by the integration of f ds. So you have f dot ds and you integrate that from a point A to a point B. Now when you do this what you are simply doing is integrating f cos theta ds but what does it actually mean? So if I have a force displacement graph as you can see in the figure, you have two points A and B. And I want to ask the question, what is the total work done in going from one point A to a point B? And to answer that question, I am looking at the force displacement curve. So if you are given a force displacement curve as shown in the figure and you have to find out the work done, let's try to understand what this means. Now in this force displacement curve, I can ask what is the force at a particular point or for a small displacement, infinitesimal displacement. So if I choose a small piece of this graph that is a small displacement ds, I say that in this small displacement ds, the force acting on this strip was f and then I can find the work done during this small portion by 
taking the dot product of the force F with dS. Now, if I do that, then I will get the work done in this small strip. But I don't want the work done in this small strip. I want the work done from A to B. So now, if I want to find the work done from A to B, I will divide A and B into many such small strips and add up the work done in each of these strips to find the total work done from A to B. Now, why do I have to do all this? Why did I simply not do Fs cos theta? To remind you again, I am doing this because the work done has to be found for a variable force. If the force was constant, then I would simply do F dot S. That's what we have been doing. But these are the methods we are talking about for a variable force. And here I am asking the question, what is the work done in going from point A to B? And how do I find that from a force displacement curve? And now you know, you simply divide the area between A and B into many such small strips, add up all these areas and what you get is the total work done from A to B. Finally, in conclusion, this means that to find the work done from one point A to another point B, you take a look at the force displacement curve and find the entire area under the force displacement curve and that is the area that you need that is the work done by a variable force is the area under a force displacement curve. So those were the concepts of work and we saw that you can find the work done in case of a constant force and a variable force. We now move on to the concept of energy. Now energy by definition is the capacity to do work. If you have energy you are able to perform some work. And there are different types of energy, the most famous of which is the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy by definition is the energy that a body has by virtue of its motion and kinetic energy has two important formulae, the first one being half mv square where m is the mass of the body, v is its velocity. And similarly, kinetic energy also has another formula which is p square by 2m which is actually nothing but the same formula but I have eliminated velocity in favor of momentum where p is the momentum. So kinetic energy has these two important formulae. As usual, I am telling you that kinetic energy is nothing but the energy possessed by a body due to its motion which means that anything that moves has kinetic energy. For example, this child playing on this machine is also in possession of kinetic energy because it is moving. The trees that are rustling, the wind that is blowing, me walking through this park, all of us because we are moving have energy due to motion and it is this energy that we will call as kinetic energy. Just like kinetic energy, there is also another component to mechanical energy and that is potential energy. Potential energy is the energy possessed by a body by virtue of its position or configuration. Now when the body possesses potential energy by virtue of its position, we say that it has gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is denoted by the letter U and the formula is minus G M1 M2 by R where M1 and M2 are the two masses of the two bodies in question. So if you ask the question, what is the potential energy of me with respect to a separate object, then you will multiply our masses by the gravitational constant and divide it by the distance between us. And that is gravitational potential energy. This formula is important because this formula is used to find the gravitational potential energy of any object with respect to any other object where m1 and m2 are the masses of the two objects and r is the distance between them. But the second formula for gravitational potential energy which is mgh upon 1 plus h by r is mostly used with reference to the earth. This formula is usually used to understand what is the gravitational potential energy of an object with respect to the earth. And that's why in this formula you have only one mass which is the mass of the object, you have h which is the height of the object from the surface of the earth and capital R which is the radius of the earth. Of course you could also be asked this question to find the gravitational potential energy of an object with respect to a different planet in which case h would be the height of that object with respect to the surface of that planet 
and r would be the radius of that planet. Simply speaking, we know that objects have gravitational potential energy when they are at some height at least from the center of the earth. On the surface of the earth, almost every object which has height has gravitational potential energy. Take a look at this child sitting on top of this slide. Sitting at the very top, this child has some height with respect to the surface of the earth and as long as there is some height with respect to the center of the earth, you will always have energy due to position which we will call as gravitational potential energy. Now, gravitational potential energy is the potential energy that a body possesses because of its position. But you also have potential energy possessed by an object by virtue of a change in its configuration. What exactly am I talking about? Every one of you must have played with this at some point. It's nothing but a catapult. A catapult is an object which you have to pull the string off and then it will suspend an object which you have held against the string to a very far off displacement. And this is what we call as something that is elastic. And from this comes the idea that if you change the configuration of an object, it can possess energy and this energy is nothing but the elastic potential energy. The formula for this elastic potential energy, which is denoted by Pe, that is u again, is half kx square, where x is the displacement from the equilibrium position. And this elastic potential energy is what causes the object to go to a very further distance. So, simply speaking, when you pull on this catapult, you are displacing it from its equilibrium position. And this distance x, which you have moved from the equilibrium position to the extreme position on one side, causes the catapult to have elastic potential energy. And this object then converts this elastic potential energy into kinetic energy, catapulting the object to a further distance. And this is the second type of potential energy, that is elastic potential energy. And from here on, we arrive at the most important statement in the history of the physics universe. Arguably, the law of conservation of energy is the most famous statement that everyone has come across at some point in their lives. Energy can neither be created, neither can it be destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. Thus, any system which is isolated or closed in such a system, the sum of all types of energy or I can say the total energy always remains constant. A very simple example of this that we see in our everyday life is, for example, turning on the electricity. As you can see, these lights in the park are also an example of transformation of one type of energy into another. How is that? For example, the electricity that is reaching through the wires into these lamps is an example of electrical energy. This electrical energy then gets converted into light energy which you can see as it causes illumination in the park but it also gets converted into heat which you know if you touch this lamp and find that it's quite hot. Just like the conservation of energy, you also have a different law which is the law of conservation of mechanical energy. Mechanical energy has two components that is potential energy and kinetic energy. So the law of conservation of mechanical energy basically says that the total mechanical energy of an isolated system also remains constant. And I can say this in a different way as well. I say that the change in kinetic energy is always converted into work. That is the only reason there will be a loss or gain in the kinetic energy of a system is if there is work done. So I can say this mathematically as Kf minus Ki, where Kf is the final kinetic energy, Ki is the initial kinetic energy, is equal to the integration of Fds. What is the integration of Fds? That's nothing but the work done as we saw earlier. So I can say that change in kinetic energy is work done. The law of conservation of mechanical energy is simply saying that K plus U, which is the total of potential and kinetic energy, is a constant number. 
and that is precisely the statement for law of conservation of mechanical energy. Finally, let's also take a look at the two different types of forces that exist in nature. We have conservative and non-conservative forces. Conservative forces are part independent forces, which means that these forces will have the same effect no matter what part is taken. Non-conservative forces, on the other hand, are path dependent forces. Let's take a look at an example. As you can see here, we have two leaves which are falling from this tree. Now, because of the wind, the motion of both these leaves will not be exactly the same. In fact, the path that they both take is very different. However, both of them will fall from the same height to the ground. So, in this case, the height that they have lost is h. And now I want to ask the question, what is the work done for each of them? That is, what is the work done by gravitational force for each of these cases? If I take a look at what is the work done by gravity in case 1, I know that work is nothing but the product of force and displacement. Now, in this case, force is nothing but the force of gravity, which is nothing but the weight of the leaf. So, I say mg, where m is the mass of the leaf and mg is the weight of the leaf, multiplied by the displacement, that is h. And of course, they are in the same direction, so the angle is 0, so I simply have to write mgh. What happens in the second case? In the second case, I know that the leaf is exactly the same. The only difference is that it went down a different path. And therefore, now if I try to write what is the work done by gravity, I'll again have the same answer. That is, mg is the force multiplied by the same displacement h. So, as you can see, that even though both the leaves took very different paths to go from A to B, the work done by gravitational force was the same. So, in such a case, gravitational force is a conservative force. So, again to remind you, a conservative force is one for which the work done is independent of the path taken. It is the force that is conservative, not the work done that is conservative. We are classifying types of forces. Because gravitational force, work done was the same, so gravitational force is a conservative force. And this is an example of path independent forces. There are forces which are path dependent. One very important and famous example is that of friction. Friction is not a conservative force. Just like the laws of conservation of mechanical and total energy, we also have one more very important statement that is the work energy theorem. Now, the work energy theorem is a statement which basically says that work can be converted into kinetic energy and kinetic energy can be converted into work. So, simply speaking, it says that work done by a force in displacing a body is equal to the change in kinetic energy of the body. So, if you take a look at any body and you see that its kinetic energy is changing, you can be sure that some work is being done due to this change in the kinetic energy of the body. So, to find out how much work is done by a body, you take a look at its kinetic energy because it is kinetic energy which can be converted into work and vice versa. So, mathematically, I can say this as W is equal to half m v square minus u square, where a half m v square is the final kinetic energy and half m u square is the initial kinetic energy. So, what I have actually written is the difference between the final and the initial kinetic energies and I have said that this is equal to the change in kinetic energy which is nothing but the work done. In other words, I can also say that kf minus ki is nothing but the work done. That is also integration fds as I have previously mentioned. So, this is the work energy theorem. To understand this, let us take an example of playing carom on a carom board. If I look at how we play carom, we see that we have different positions on the carom board. This one is a striker. The striker is placed between these two lines and using the striker, we will hit different coins on the board. This striker is used to hit a coin, which then the goal is to put into one of the holes. And what exactly happens when you play carom? When you play carom, what the player is actually doing is hitting the striker, that is transferring energy, which energy is transferring kinetic energy to the striker. This striker then hits the coin, transfers 
its kinetic energy to the coin. Then this coin uses this kinetic energy to create or produce a displacement and hence reach the hole on the other side. Now the idea behind telling you about this example is to understand that every time a body has to do some displacement, you can be sure that it needs kinetic energy. In this case, the coin had to go from its position to the hole and to do this it had to produce a displacement and to produce a displacement it had to do work and to do work it needed kinetic energy and who gave this the kinetic energy the striker gave this the kinetic energy but if the striker gave it the kinetic energy then the kinetic energy of the striker went down so you can see that the change in kinetic energy of the striker was equal to the change in kinetic energy of the coin and it's equal to the work done in simple words it is kinetic energy that gets converted into useful work we finally come to the last of the concepts of work energy and power that is we finally arrive at power power by definition is the time rate of doing work and whenever you hear the word rate it means time is involved so basically I'm saying power means how fast or slow you can do work so by definition power is work upon time but work itself is a dot product of force and displacement so I can say that power is F dot S upon T but S upon T is nothing but the velocity and therefore power is also the product of F and V. So I can also say that power is F dot V or F V cos theta. One other way to find power is by finding the slope of a work time graph. And therefore I also say that instantaneous power that is power in a particular instant of time is the slope that you will find from a work time graph and slope is nothing but tan theta so I say that power is dw by dt which is tan theta where theta is the angle that the graph makes with the x axis. A very simple example in understanding power is you give two people the same work and you see how long it takes to do the same work for these two different people. In more often than not, one person will be able to finish the work faster than the other. And this person who is doing the same work faster than the other person actually has more power in the physics sense of the word. So power doesn't necessarily mean muscle power the way we know it, but power actually means how fast you can do something. So in this case, as you can see, the boy is trying to put all these toys back into the box and close this bag. And the girl is trying to do the same thing. But here in this case, the boy is faster than the girl and therefore the boy has more power because he is doing the same work but in a faster period of time. So if you ask the question, who has more power, remember that you must compare the same work between two people. And then you can say that one person has more power if that person is faster. We finally come to the final section of work energy and power, that is the section on collisions. And by far, the most problems asked on this chapter are based on collisions. There are two main types, elastic and inelastic collisions. Elastic collisions are those in which the kinetic energy and the linear momentum of all the objects involved in the motion are conserved. When you say something is conserved, it means that it is the same in the beginning and at the end of the motion. So in this elastic collision, the kinetic energy and momentum at the beginning of the collision and after the collision takes place is the same. So such collisions are classified as elastic collisions. And the kind of problems that we will encounter in work energy and power are usually based on one-dimensional or two-dimensional elastic collisions. Let's take an example of a one-dimensional elastic collision. Simply speaking, elastic collision in one dimension is one where the collision takes place along a single line or direction. All the objects involved should all move along a single line. The collision should take place along that line, that is along the line of motion of the objects. We can see this in an example of a snooker table. We know that snooker is a cue sport. Simply speaking, we use this stick, which is known as a cue, to hit this white ball, and this white ball will go ahead and hit other snooker balls. It's similar to a carom board. 
Now in this case, we will use this cue to hit the white ball and this white ball will hit another ball. One dimensional elastic collision basically means that you have two objects which already initially have some velocity u1 and u2. So they are already moving with some velocity but now one of these goes and hits the other in along the same line, the line along which they were initially moving and now after the collision is over, that is after they hit each other, their velocities change and now there will be a velocity v1 and v2. Simply speaking, this is not a big deal. All collisions look exactly like this. Initially, there were two objects. They had velocities u1 and u2. Finally, there are two objects. These objects now have velocity v1 and v2, which is not a big deal. Their velocities changed because of the collision. The important thing to remember is that in elastic collision, the kinetic energy will be conserved and momentum will be conserved. And since this is a one-dimensional elastic collision, the collision should take place along the same line. Similarly, we can analyze a two-dimensional elastic collision. Again, just to remind you, elastic collision simply means kinetic energy will be conserved and momentum will be conserved. One-dimensional means the collision will take place along a single direction. So, obviously, two-dimensional means that the collision will take place in any direction on a two-dimensional plane. So, for example, as you can see, again, I have two balls which were initially moving with some velocity, but now they were not initially in the same line. And now, after one ball hits the other, you can see that they move in oblique directions. That is, they move at some angle with respect to each other. Again, now you can see that after collision, they are not along the same line, but are still on the board or the plane of the snooker table. So, it is a two-dimensional collision and it will be elastic if the kinetic energy and momentum are conserved. In contrast, inelastic collisions are those in which kinetic energy is not conserved. However, the linear momentum is still conserved. Let's take a look at a one-dimensional inelastic collision. Now, let me remind you, inelastic collision simply means that the kinetic energy is not conserved. But the most famous types of inelastic collisions are those which are known as perfectly inelastic collisions. And perfectly inelastic collisions are those in which the objects after collision move together. So, let me recap. Inelastic collision means no kinetic energy conserved. In that also, there is one separate type of inelastic collision that is perfectly inelastic collision and perfectly inelastic collision means that objects after collision move together. So, let's see an example of one dimensional perfectly inelastic collision. As you can see, these two objects were initially moving with some velocity. We are back at the Stuka table. These two balls were initially moving with some initial velocity and when one ball hits the other, the collision is taking place along the same line that is one dimensional. So, same line, but as you can see, after collision, they both move together with some different velocity. So, this is an example of perfectly inelastic collision. Similarly, we can see an example of perfectly inelastic collision in two dimension. The only difference will be that instead of the collision taking place along only one line, you will now have movement of the balls in more than one direction, that is along the plane of the snooker table. So, as you can see here, here are again two balls initially moving with some initial velocity u1 and u2. One of these goes and hits the other and because of this, they now move together in a completely different direction. The point to note is that even initially, they were not along the same line but at some angle to each other and after collision, they came together and started moving with a different velocity. So, of course, you can see from the picture itself that they are not along one direction but along two directions because they are in the plane of the snooker table and it is a perfectly inelastic collision because after collision, they are moving together and it is inelastic because the kinetic energy is not conserved. So, this wraps up all the concepts that I want to revise with you in work energy and power but more importantly, let me give you a fair warning. This does not mean that I have covered every single concept. I have given you a brief overview of the main concepts in this chapter. But I hope you were able to revise the important fundamental aspects and go ahead and get done with problem solving. 
So thank you for watching this video. If you like our channel, please subscribe by clicking on the link given below. You can also buy your very own target book by clicking on this link. Please keep watching our channel. Stay tuned for more updates.